Number one. Finding love in Japan can be tough these days. The media here says that more and more young people are suffering from Sekusu Shinai Shokugan. That pretty much translates into celibacy syndrome. Basically, no one's getting laid anymore. Half of all young people aren't in a relationship, and they pretty much all plan on staying that way. They just seem to find the whole thing bothersome. A year ago, I considered myself to be in the other half. I was a relatively attractive 24-year-old guy with a decent job. At the risk of sounding cocky, I thought I had a lot going for me, so it frustrated me that I hadn't had a girlfriend since high school. Trust me, that wasn't from lack of trying. There's a number of services in my country designed to fill this romantic void. You can hire yourself a girlfriend who'll walk around holding your hand in public, or you can even go to a cuddle cafe where you can pay a girl to just lay beside you and, like the name suggests, cuddle you. Nintendo even makes virtual girlfriend games. Oh, the wonders of technology. These solutions weren't for me though. I wanted the real deal, a proper relationship. A co-worker of mine, Goro, told me about this speed dating night that was coming up. Said that he was going, and that I should sign up too. Well, it sounded like it could be a fun time, and what did I really have to lose? For those of you who don't know how a speed dating night works, here's a quick rundown. A bunch of single men and women turn up to the event. All the women go and sit at a table by themselves, and all of the men get told which one to sit with. Then, a three minute timer starts. In that time, you either have a nice chat, or you sit there in awkward silence. Hopefully not the latter. Once time's up, a bell rings, and you move on to the next girl's table. Once everybody's had a three minute date with all of the other members of the opposite sex, you all mark down on a piece of paper who you'd be interested in seeing again. At the end, some matches are made. Some will get lucky, and some not so much. It was the night of the event, and to be honest, I was feeling pretty confident. I put on my best clothes, sprayed on some cologne, and practiced a few lines in the mirror before setting out. Good guy Goro came by and gave me a ride. Not only were we co-workers, but we had been friends since high school as well. Goro loved chasing after the girls at the clubs and bars, but always had limited success. Unfortunately for Goro, he was on the shorter and chubbier side. Imagine a Japanese Danny DeVito. I hoped the night would go well for him. The speed dating gets underway, and to start with, things are going great. It's about halfway through the night, and there haven't been any uncomfortable silences or anything. There was Akane, the bubbly young Tokyo girl who had moved here for work. Honoka, this hot intelligent chick with a great body. Yumi, this more alternative girl with bleach blonde hair, pale skin, and a really cute smile. And then I got to Kyoko. As I sat down, I thought there was something strangely familiar about her, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. She was pretty average looking, so maybe she just reminded me of someone else I knew. Hey, how's it going? I'm Shin. I know. I'm Kyoko. Nice to meet you. I know. Well, I did have a name tag on, but that was still pretty weird. Other than that, things started well enough, with her doing most of the talking. Well, all of the talking really. She spoke so fast and incoherently, it made listening to it all almost impossible. One thing did stand out though. You can check it out when they show it on TV sometime. How's working at Takata anyway? It must be interesting. Oh my god, have you ever seen New Burrows? They do great seafood there. Wait, what the hell? Takata? How did she know what company I worked for? Had I let that slip somehow? Goro was yet to see this girl, so there's no way he could have mentioned it. I would have asked her if she'd given me time to respond, but she just moved on to more incessant talking. I sat there politely, until the three minute timer released me from that purgatory. I stood up, said my nice to meet yous, and moved on to the next table. I did a lot worse the rest of that evening. Distracted by the fact that that Kyoko girl kept staring at me. Like this unblinking, penetrating stare. Once all of the dates were over, I met back up with Goro. 
Hey bro, did you recognize her? Huh? I didn't know what he was talking about. That girl, Kyoko, from our high school. Man, I can't believe how much she's changed. Kyoko. I honestly couldn't place her in my head. The name rang a bell, sure, but Kyoko is common, and our school was pretty big. She must have really changed. I guess that's why I thought she seemed familiar, though. Huh, mystery solved. Goro continued. Yeah, man, she's really blossomed. She wasn't really into me, though. Pfft, what a jib. So Kyoko knew me from school, huh? Maybe I had her on Facebook and had forgotten all about her. That could explain how she knew where I worked. But if that's the case, why wouldn't she have mentioned knowing me from school? Ah well, she wasn't really my thing anyway. I marked her down as a non-match on my card and forgot all about it, put it down to being one of those weird things, and figured I'd never see her again. Goro might not have been so lucky at the event, but I ended up getting a few matches, and actually went on a few more dates with some of the girls. Of all of them, I got along with Yumi the best. She was the one with dyed blonde hair. Pretty unusual for a Japanese chick, but she could pull it off really well. On our third date, we're eating dinner in a restaurant together. We'd just finished our main course, and were laughing and slightly drunk on sake, when I noticed one of the other diners on a far table from us. They were half hiding behind a menu. It was that Kyoko girl, sitting by herself and staring over at us, doing her best to remain unseen. I mentioned it to Yumi, who subtly glanced over to look at her. Well, she confirmed it definitely was the same Kyoko girl from the speed dating night, and made a joke about how she was probably following us around town. It was funny at first, but by the time our desserts came out, she was still just sitting there, totally alone, staring at us from behind her menu. Okay, either she was really indecisive about what she wanted to eat, or she's keeping a watch on us for some reason. I decided to go over and say something to her, but as I stood up to do so, she leapt up and ran out of the restaurant. That was unexpected. Still, the night went on. Yumi came back to my place for some... <clears throat> coffee, and ended up staying the night. I was really starting to fall for this girl. Coffee started becoming a regular occurrence, and it wasn't long before Yumi and I made our relationship official. The whole speed dating thing had actually paid off. No virtual girlfriends for me, thank god. One evening, Goro called me up, and asked Yumi and I on a double date sort of thing, said that one of the girls from the speed dating night was interested in him after all, and had suggested going to see a movie at the cinema. Some corny rom-com. Well, I wanted to help a brother out, so I agreed. When we arrived, Goro was standing there with, you guessed it, Kyoko. Hey bro, check it out. A blast from the past, huh? Goro said, taking me to one side. Bet you never saw this one coming, huh? Me bagging a hot babe like this? I guess Goro thought he'd surprise me with his date being Kyoko. Well, I was certainly surprised. Neither Yumi or I knew what to say. We kind of just stood there, awkwardly. Kyoko smiled at me. Good to see you again, Shin. Yeah, yeah. Hey. She would not take her eyes off me and acted like Yumi and Goro weren't there at all, even when they tried to talk to her. As we shuffled into the theatre, Kyoko made sure that Goro didn't sit next to me, and that she did. This was just too weird. It was clear that Kyoko had set this whole thing up, and got Goro to ask me along with them. I guess little Goro took over the thinking for a while, and he just went along with the plans in hopes of getting laid. During the trailers for the movie, I gave Yumi a nudge, and we both uncomfortably made our getaway before Kyoko could ask any questions. This was just the tip of the iceberg. For the next week, Yumi kept telling me that she had seen Kyoko following her around town, glaring at her with hatred in her eyes. Honestly, I was worried that Yumi might leave me, simply because she was scared of Kyoko's obsession. I suppose that was Kyoko's plan. 
this whole thing came to a climax on one weekend night. Yumi and I had been out for a few drinks, and came back to my place to spend the night. I put the key in the lock to open the front door to my apartment, but I needn't have bothered. The door just swung open. I'd forgotten to lock the bloody thing before setting out. That was so unlike me. Thankfully, nothing was missing or out of place, and I just cursed my stupidity. We stayed up pretty late that night, fooling around, and before sleeping, Yumi went upstairs to use the bathroom. In the meantime, I laid my head on the pillow to rest my eyes. Then, the sound of footsteps entered the dark bedroom. That was quick, I thought to myself, too tired to open my eyes. I waited for Yumi to hop into bed beside me. But she didn't. She just stood there, breathing heavily. Yumi? What are you doing, baby? I whispered tiredly. Then, in a soft reply. It's Kyoko. My muscles locked up. With a racing heart, I opened my eyes to see a silhouette at the foot of my bed. I couldn't make out many details. Are you awake? Yeah, no fucking shit I am. What the hell are you playing at? How the hell did you get in here? The landlady let me in. I've been waiting for you to get back. She flicked the light switch on the wall behind her, and the room lit up. I could see Kyoko now. There, in a thin nightgown, like she was ready for bed. What made my stomach churn, though? was the thing in her right hand. It was a knife. What the fuck is this? Get the hell out before I call the cops! Shh. Kyoko continued to take unnecessarily deep breaths, like she was gasping for air or something. Why do you keep ignoring me, Shin? I, I haven't been ignoring you. Just put down the knife and, and tell me what this is all about, huh? It's about this. Why do you always act so weird around me? It's like you never want me around. I don't get it. I show you nothing but love, and get this in return? This girl was living on another planet. It's like she really thought we were in a relationship because of that three minute date we had, and she thought I was cheating on her or something. This was a total shock to my system, and I was struggling to process what was actually happening. It was like I had woken up in a nightmare. As I sat there on my bed, keeping a close eye on the blade she was flailing around, I heard the toilet upstairs flush. Yumi. Your new girl's very pretty, she said, cradling the knife. Tell me, Shin, is she really so much prettier than me? I was terrified about what Kyoko might do to Yumi given half the chance. I heard my girlfriend's footsteps moving upstairs, and her concerned voice calling out my name. She had clearly heard the commotion. Well, we can change that. Kyoko turned her back to me, and stepped towards the door. This insane bitch was going for Yumi. There was no way in hell I was just going to sit back like a coward. With Kyoko's back to me, I decided to take my chances. I leapt from my bed and charged, slamming the full weight of my body into her. She screamed, I guess not expecting me to attack her. I flew downwards onto Kyoko, the blade in her hand slicing a deep gash into my leg. But I didn't care. The adrenaline masked the pain. I held her pinned down, restraining her hand with the knife as best I could, and screamed for Yumi to get out of the apartment to run to one of the neighbor's places and call the police. When she realized what was happening, she followed my instructions, and ran to Old Lady Bankai's place next door. Once I was sure Yumi was safe, I let go of Kyoko. The deep wound in my leg was giving me trouble, and starting to make me feel lightheaded. I left Kyoko there, not caring if she was hurt badly or not, and hobbled next door to wait for the police. By the time they showed up, Kyoko had fled. It didn't take them long to track her down, though. She was hardly a master criminal after all. Just a delusional young woman. Before escaping, she had stolen one of my combs and some items of clothing from my wash basket. Little keepsakes, I suppose. As it turns out, 
Kyoko had been obsessed with me since high school. An obsession that hadn't faltered over the years. Apparently, I'd caught her eye back then, and she had been stalking me on and off ever since, monitoring my movements at work and in my spare time, collecting as much information as possible about me. She was so ordinary looking, I never even noticed her. On the night of the speed dating, she decided to take things up a level and make her move. I suppose she thought she might somehow impress me by already knowing where I worked, or that I'd be flattered by the fact that she'd done her research. The fact that I didn't mark her down as someone I'd like to see again didn't deter her. I'm still not sure how she knew I was going to that event. What I do know is this. She had watched me long enough to learn the entrance code to my apartment complex. She had spent the last few weeks convincing my landlady that she was in fact my girlfriend. After gaining her trust, she came by on the night of the incident, got my landlady to let her in by pretending she had lost her key, and then hid in my apartment, waiting for me to get back. Kyoko had planned on disfiguring Yumi that night. Perhaps worse. Unbelievably, Kyoko only received a suspended sentence, and was allowed back on the streets immediately after sentencing. Neither Yumi or I could believe it. We did manage to get a restraining order though, which seems to have convinced her to stay away from us. We haven't seen or heard from her for the past year. Recently, I checked on Kyoko's social media profiles. Looking through old pictures of her online, I remembered who she was from school. This quiet, mild-mannered girl. It's always the ones you never suspect. She's currently living in Tokyo, and seems to be just as deranged as she was back then. Good luck out there, guys. Number 2 This is a story I didn't personally experience. I was told it by a good friend of mine, Yori and it takes place in Fukuoka many years ago. It's a pretty wild tale, but Yori's not the kind of guy to just make something like this up. Every time he tells it, he speaks with conviction and sincerity, and I for one totally believe him. In his youth, he had a friend called Takeshi. Now this guy was a real rebel by Japanese standards, especially back in the day. For example, his favourite pastime was apparently getting drunk and then going to a pinsaron. Pinsarons are basically blowjob clubs. Sometimes he'd get all the guys drunk, Yori included, and drag them all along to this dominatrix bar. Ever the showman, Takeshi liked to get on stage and have beautiful women drip hot wax on his body. Yori's got a million of these stories, so his old rebellious chum must have been quite fun to be around. As their group of friends got older, they all started to mature. All of them, that is, except for Takeshi. He still went out pretty much nightly. Considering Takeshi's lifestyle, it didn't surprise Yori all that much when he told him about his new girlfriend, a girl he had met at a strip club. Her name was Miku. It's not like they happened to just bump into each other. She was actually one of the strippers at this place called Asobi and they met while she gave him a lap dance. Now, if you think that dating a stripper sounds like a bad idea, then you're a lot smarter than Takeshi was. What the poor guy failed to realise was that Asobi was run by the Yakuza, pretty much the Japanese mafia. These guys are no joke, and even wannabe tough guys like Takeshi knew better than to meddle in their affairs. Problem was, he had been hanging around with Miku for the past two weeks before she dropped this bombshell. According to Yori, Miku was crazy. Like real stripper crazy. She was also totally obsessed with Takeshi, and would momentarily lose her mind if she even saw him glance in the direction of another girl. Or, God forbid, if one tried to talk to him. Takeshi was a good looking guy, so this happened more than once. He'd have to pry her off them, kicking and screaming. Then, as quickly as she had lost her shit, she'd zen out and be totally normal again. Takeshi had been thinking about cutting things off with her, since she was just major trouble. This new Yakuza development pushed him to do so. He dumped her as soon as she told him, 
calling her crazy, a mental train wreck, and that even though she was hot, she was nowhere near hot enough to risk a Yakuza beating. She went ballistic, right there in the middle of the street, with everyone standing around. Said that she didn't want her boyfriend to say such horrible things about her, but that if he apologized, she'd forgive him because she just loved him that much. If he didn't apologize, she'd make sure he never called her such things again. She'd make him eat those words. He told her where to stick it, turned his back on her, and walked away. In Takeshi's head, that was the end of it. That night, Takeshi went out for some drinks with the guys to celebrate being a free man again. Told them all about Miku's Yakuza ties, and how he had just dodged a real bullet. He joked about how she had gone crazy in the street. Well, Yuri and the guys warned him to stay safe. Miku was unstable after all. Brushing off their concern, Takeshi stumbled home and into bed. In the early hours of the morning, a visitor came knocking. It was Miku, and she wasn't alone. A couple of Yakuza goons held down Takeshi, while Miku produced a pair of scissors. The gangsters wrenched Takeshi's mouth open and pulled out his tongue. I warned you this would happen, my love, she said. I just hate it when you say such horrible things. With the pair of scissors in one hand, Miku held his tongue tight and went to work. Turns out she was a girl of her word, and Takeshi really was forced to eat his. He developed a bit of a speech impediment after that, as you can probably imagine. With the police not willing to get involved in Yakuza business, Takeshi was left up shit creek without a paddle. Miku actually wanted to keep their relationship going, and what Miku wanted, Miku got. Yori said that Takeshi wasn't about to roll over and become some sort of boyfriend slave. Through gargled words, he told him that he planned on getting rid of Miku, one way or another. I asked Yori if he was successful or not. He said he didn't know. Takeshi went missing not long after, and nobody ever heard from him again. Miku suddenly stopped working at Asobi, and the police only half-heartedly looked into the case. The way Yori sees it, three things could have happened to Takeshi. Scenario 1. He used his brain for once in his life, took his car and fled the city, started a new life somewhere. Scenario 2. The Yakuza got to him and took him out to the hills, buried him in a deep grave, hopefully not still alive. Or Scenario 3. The Yakuza got to him with Miku and are keeping him somewhere as her plaything. He really hopes it's not that last one. Number 3 I was 16 years old when this happened, and still at school in Osaka. While there, one particular classmate of mine always caught my attention. A beautiful girl with chocolate-coloured hair and big, bright eyes. Her name was Suzumi. Not only was she really good looking, but she was kind and smart too. A triple whammy. Needless to say, I had the biggest of crushes on her. Problem was, I could never muster up the courage to ask her out, since there were always a bunch of other guys swooning around her, desperately peacocking for her attention. Now, I wasn't an ugly guy per se, but I wasn't exactly a stud either. So, you can imagine my surprise when she sat beside me one lunchtime and asked if I wanted to go to the beach with her on the weekend. Like, an actual date. I couldn't believe my luck. There was no way I was going to say no to that. It was a dream come true when we finally made our relationship official. For a while, everything was great. But as the weeks went by, a different side of her started to rise to the surface. She didn't like me hanging around with my best friend. He was another guy, a gay guy called Jiro. For whatever reason, she thought he had a crush on me. I assured her that wasn't the case at all. Jiro and I had been best buds since we were small kids, and we thought of each other like brothers. Besides that, I wasn't that way inclined in the slightest. 
I made all of this very clear, and told her how much I loved her, and to stop overanalyzing things. The mid-semester break rolled around, and Suzume started becoming extremely possessive. Jiro's parents were out of the country on an extended holiday, so our whole group of friends used his house as a sort of hangout pad. Occasionally, a girl or two would join us too. Suzumi hated that I went to these events. She was irked by the fact I wouldn't spend every waking moment with her, and couldn't understand why I might want to just chill with my friends occasionally. If the focus wasn't 100% on her, then her sweet and innocent demeanour would melt away, and she'd turn vicious and spiteful. She would even start to get mad when I paid my cat attention instead of her. This was starting to get out of hand, and honestly, Suzumi was starting to become more of a hassle than she was worth. I told Jiro and the guys about it, and they all suggested I cut things off with her. It took a little longer for that to fully sink in. This was my first girlfriend after all, and she was really hot, but nobody should have to put up with this sort of crap. As the days progressed, her neediness turned sinister. She started breaking my things to get her own way, threatened to cut herself if I wanted to see my friends. I'd sometimes even catch her following me around town when we hadn't made plans to see each other, staring at me from afar, and not even coming over to say hi. I'd call out to her, but she'd remain expressionless. Then she'd walk away and disappear into the crowd. It no longer felt like I had a girlfriend, but a stalker. I'd never been in a relationship before, but I knew this wasn't normal behaviour. The final straw came when I caught her slamming my cat's tail in the door. She claimed it was unintentional, but I knew otherwise. I saw the way she eyed the poor thing before pushing the door as forcefully as she could, probably hoping to do more damage than she did. She was jealous. Jealous of a cat. I ended things right then and there, and told her to get the hell out of my house. There were some tears, but thankfully she left without much resistance. I took my cat to the vets, and he ended up having to have his tail amputated. I had kept Suzumi's craziness a secret from my family for the whole time we dated, and decided to keep things that way. I guess I felt sorry for her. I just said that I had accidentally stepped on the cat's tail. After that, I didn't see Suzumi again for the rest of the break. That didn't stop her from constantly messaging me on social media sites and by text. Her messages were mostly pleas for forgiveness. Others were the complete opposite, telling me how she'd make me see the error of my ways, and how I'd regret leaving her. They were the ravings of a lunatic. I ignored each one. The mid-semester break came to an end, and I was sort of nervous about how things would go on the first day back at school. Suzume was a lot more popular than I was. Was she going to start spreading gossip, painting me as the bad guy? I had no idea. Whatever the case, my small group of friends and I knew the truth. That underneath Suzume's perfect exterior, there was a stone-cold bitch, nuts beyond belief. I sat there in class on that Monday morning, hoping that Jiro would come in before Suzumi. One by one, people started to enter, but two desks remained empty. There was no sign of either Suzumi or Jiro. On top of that, Jiro wasn't responding to my calls or texts. That wasn't like him. Well, perhaps he had an early morning dentist's appointment or something. No. The whole day, Jiro was absent from school, and I couldn't get a hold of him. My suspicion got the better of me, and that evening, I decided to visit his house. When I arrived, his house was surrounded by police tape. Two police cars were outside, and a couple of officers were standing by the front door. I asked them what the hell was going on, but was told that it was a private matter. I told them that the kid who lived inside was a close friend of mine, and demanded an answer. They kept silent, and one of them told me to go home, said that I shouldn't stick around. Well, I was a stubborn young man, 
and so as long as I kept my distance from the property, there wasn't anything they could do to get rid of me. From inside the house, I could hear the occasional female scream, like a wailing sound. I couldn't work out if they were angry, or scared, or heartbroken. Regardless, each time one rang out, my heart sank in my chest. What on earth was going on inside? Had Jiro's parents come home early, and some sort of domestic incident taken place? Had there been an accident? I waited until two cops came out, dragging a chocolate-haired girl by her arms, her hands cuffed. She struggled and screamed before looking up for a means of escape. That's when her eyes met mine. Suzume. Her bright eyes that I had once fallen for had turned dull. They began to water. She dropped her head in shame, avoiding my stare. Without even thinking, I ran up to her, desperate to find out what was going on. I was pushed aside by one of the cops as they forced her into the squad car. I'll be back soon. Don't think about running off with a slut, or she'll die too, she said quietly, as if only I could hear it, as if what she had just said was completely normal and every day. Before I could respond, the car door was slammed shut. An ambulance arrived not long after. Two medics rushed inside the house. I remained in the same spot, refusing to move. I wish that I had. Rolled out on a board, pale-faced and with dead eyes, was Jiro. He had been stabbed multiple times in the chest and neck. Another officer inside had been working on saving his life, but it was no use. Suzumi had been holding him hostage in his own home. She got the idea that Jiro was behind our breakup, and not her own crazy actions. Marks on Jiro's body suggested that he had been bound and tortured. When a female friend of his dropped by and saw what was going on, she ran for her life and called the cops. Rather than leave things there and surrender herself to the police, Suzume decided to finish the job. It took them so long to get her out of the house because she was threatening to kill herself too. My biggest regret is not telling people what had happened when she broke my cat's tail. Remorselessly hurting animals is a warning sign of a psychopath. As of right now, Suzume is behind bars. She managed to escape the death penalty because of her age, and the fact that there was only one victim. She'll probably only spend around 15 more years in prison before getting out on parole. If she ever does fulfill her promise, if she ever does come back for me, I'll kill her myself. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Well, hopefully you can't relate too well to the stories uh, told in this one. They're pretty extreme, so uh, yeah, I hope you haven't gone through anything similar. But I always do enjoy these Yandere stories and all the other Japanese ones as well. There's something a little different about them from the rest of the stories I narrate. So if you enjoy them as much as I do, then be sure to do some naughty things with that like button. I've got a couple more videos planned, uh, and they're going to be coming out very soon, so uh, keep your eyes out for that. And until then, why not consider joining the Lazy Legion by hitting that subscribe button as well, if you haven't already. Until the next video, guys. You all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.